Good evening and a very, very warm welcome to you wherever you may be. Welcome to episode 50 of the uh, Geelong Region Soccer Show. My name is Tonchi Prusak. Joining me as he does week in, week out, Steve Curtin. Steve, happy birthday. It's our 50th anniversary. How are you? Yeah, good. Thanks, Tonchi. We got the balloons inflated just in time. Too bad they're not helium in case we need to do any (laughs) cheap laughs later on. But uh, many congratulations, mate, on steering the show uh, to uh, to fifty episodes. Uh, on a on a serious note, it's uh, it's a great effort. So uh, very well done, and I hope we can have a good celebration of that uh, tonight. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And how you how you been doing? Very festive. I'm in a festive mood. It's it's time to celebrate. It's time to uh, t- time to um, it's time to recall how it all started in the end. And and really, it's it's a chance here to to give a real um uh, acknowledgement to oh maybe 30 odd people 40 odd people who um initially um uh, uh, supported us through a fundraising campaign a gofundme campaign where i think our aim was to to to, to get three thousand dollars or something like that in the end we ended up getting four thousand and that pretty much financed the first 10 episodes um during that time fnr football nation radio got in touch with myself um, and the late Andrew um, um, Andrew Shears, um, who sadly is no longer with us, but um, you know he was very instrumental right at the start in being involved. And um, look, it just happened from from one thing to another, and it, it w- was originally going to be just a podcast um, turned into a full blown radio show. Um, and then obviously with the coronavirus earlier this year, unfortunately, um, we thought that we were going to be off air. Well, the wonders of modern technology, they have come such a long way, Steve. Um, and we've seen it over the last 12 months since you've been on board. And uh, it's, um, it's, been, it's, been a, it's been a great partnership having you on board. And geez, we've, we've, we've really, really had some great guests over that time and continue to do so. And tonight's guests... Let's talk about them. They are going to be incredible, incredible guests. Tell us about our guests tonight, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Tonchi. Uh, Tonight we've got for a second appearance back on the show. It's the chair of the GRFC. It's Mr. Mike McKinstry, and he's waiting in the green room right now. And uh, looking forward to having a second chat to Mike. Uh, It was uh, very enjoyable last time, Tonchi. Yeah, no, he's got some uh, updated information. Jeez, he's had a he's had a real baptism of fire at the helm of the GRFC um, in a year when we've been oh yeah. gosh, the uh, the coronavirus is cra- uh, paying havoc with them um, with the sport. Obviously, there's been all sorts of fun and games behind the scenes. But uh, um, Mike will tell us all about a very important meeting that was held last week between the um, Geelong clubs, the Geelong R- the GRFC officials, and Football Victoria officials as well. So. More about that a bit later on, but uh, we are one of the lucky ones, the lucky ones in Victoria, that is, that we can still have some form of competition happening, and we're talking about the juniors. We're into week three. Will there be a week four? I'm sure there will. I'm sure there will. Um, I, I hear the Geelong's figures are um, um, surprisingly steady, um, despite down the road getting 500 plus and uh, up the road in Colac getting some more, but um, yeah. Hopefully, Steve, we can have um, a few more weeks at least, if not the entire junior season, because um, we've got something to talk about, um, which we'll talk about in the news desk, but uh, a new competition or a new division that was just kicked off on the weekend just gone Mm. by. That's right, Tonchi. We'll talk about that in the news desk in a moment. And yeah, as you mentioned there, no new cases in in the Greater Geelong region today, so 31 Notice you said Greater. Notice you said greater. Yes, greater. <laughs> anyway, sorry, buddy. But uh, um, apart from um, Mike McKinstry, who's going to be coming on very, very shortly, we've also got the doyen, the doyen of local football, a true historian. And, mate, when he opens his mouth, everyone stops and listens. Who are we talking about? <laughs> He's a pioneer of the football scene in Geelong. He's one of the great historians, not only um, in the Geelong region, but in Australia, and it's Mr. Roy Hay. So looking forward to reminiscing some uh, fascinating stories about football uh, indoors in the 80s with mullets and everything. It's going to be great. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be fantastic. There was a sneak preview of of um, what we're talking about on our Facebook page earlier today. There were 10 strapping young blokes there reading a now defunct soccer newspaper. I think it was the Soccer Weekly or Soccer Action, mm. one of those two. 
and um, we actually called out for um, people to uh, um, see if they could identify all 10 of them. Now, um, uh, Heather Rodajevic, who is married to one of those gentlemen in question, she, um, she, first attempt, she got nine out of 10, right? She, she, um, she mentioned uh, George Domovsky. Big shout out to George from Geelong Soccer Club. Mentioned him twice and forgot to, uh, of course, uh, uh, name someone else. But then she did correct herself. So uh, Heather did get all, all 10 of them right. But there's a few there that have got mullets. There are a few there that have got hair. Today, they do not have hair. So a lot has changed in those 30-odd years. But uh, I guess the, the reason or the, the, the main catalyst um, – Steve for that for that um, interview with Roy was the um the sad passing last week of of, of a man who was um synonymous with um, um community um active or community activism if you like here in mm. Geelong was involved with the YMCA was heavily involved with the Geelong um, football club because he was an actual premiership player. Can you remember what year it was? Uh, 1952, uh, in his debut season, he uh, won the flag and the best and fairest. So, uh, there you go. And uh, Jeff, Williams, Jeff Williams sadly passed at the age of 89 just last week, and he was better known for our community. He was better known as the, um, the hardworking, the diligent, um, and a very, very re respected president of the then Geelong Indoor Soccer Association back in the 1980s. So, uh, yeah, Roy will be telling us a fair bit about that. And, uh, and in fact, I think that's where I first met Roy, playing um, against him on the um, indoor soccer courts many, many moons ago. And we look forward to uh, reminiscing about that. So it should be really, really interesting. But, uh, mate, shall we get straight into the uh, yeah, news um, desk? Just, so yeah, just, just, just before the news desk, a special shout-out to uh, my girlfriend, Kate, celebrating her 30th in uh, isolation over the weekend. Um, and also by popular demand after last week's uh, cameo, we might be able to get my mum, Jenny, to appear on the <laughs> show again in the future as well. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. A big, sh big shout out to Kate. Happy 30th. Um, more importantly, congratulations for uh, for uh, for uh, sticking with Steve. Jeez, that must be a hard one. No, <laughs> I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Steve, um, we'll, we'll... That's fair enough, Conchi, I think. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you scurry off and get ready for the news desk. Um, folks, you're tuning in to the Geelong Region Soccer Show. We're in a very festive mood tonight. Despite all the doom and gloom around us, to the north and to the south and to the east and to the west, Geelong, we are an island, and tonight we're celebrating 50 episodes. Don't go away. Steve, over to you. And to the news desk for Monday the 27th. Yep, we've just lost Steve. Hello, we've just lost Steve. Looks like he's just frozen. That's Parramatta. not... Hello, I think we lost you there for a oh, second. Oh, hello. hello. Yep. Can you still hear me? We can, we can. Can you repeat that again? Sorry, mate. Not a good start to the news desk. Um, the region's A-League club, Western United, has returned to action following the COVID shutdown of the A-League with the win over Melbourne victory at Bankwest Stadium in Parramatta on Saturday night. Tomislav Uzkok opened the scoring with his maiden A-League goal and Max Burgess continued where he left off before the break, also finding the back of the net. Storm Roo kept the victory in the game with a late-headed finish, but the Green and Blacks made it three wins from three for the season in this new local derby fixture. United, uh, well in the hunt for the top six, uh, or sixth place at least, uh, being just one point behind Adelaide United, and they have two games in hand over the South Australians. And the action continues tonight as the Mariners host the Wanderers from 7.30. We'll keep you posted of any score in that one. And as you see there on screen their victory can make amends when they face Brisbane Raw on Wednesday evening. Melbourne City make their long-awaited return to on-field action on Saturday at 5 p.m. against Sydney FC, and that will be also the free-to-air game if you'd like to tune in on your national broadcaster on TV. And Western United take the field again on Sunday when they take on the Jets. Tonchi. Mate, um, I tell you what, I watched that Western United game. Did you did you have a chance to watch us, Steve? I, I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, tune in and uh, yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed watching a bit of uh, Saturday evening winter football and uh, yeah. two Victorian teams going at it in uh, the western suburbs of Sydney and um, 
the result that I was hoping for, so it made it all the better, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. What look, did you I, think? Look, I, I I was I was impressed by Burgess, Max Burgess. He's 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 a, he's a star. He, he, I mean, they're talking already about Graham Arnold, who was in in um in attendance. <laughs> Watching the game and when's he going to call him up and this and that. Oh, look, I think time will, you know, it, it will happen. Um, you know, um, I, he impressed me. Look, I was also impressed by a lot of the victory youngsters. Um, mm. Given a chance towards the end of the game, some of them were really like, like, uh, look, I think there's great potential there. And look, some of them are all. They're, 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 a lot of them are all, let's face it. But the only way they're going to get better is to be given the opportunity. And, you know, in a way, thank you. Thank goodness for the COVID crisis. One thing that it has done is kind of driven maybe some of the overpriced imports and maybe some of the other players that probably, oh, look, do they need to be there? Should they be there? I don't know. Mm. Um, but at least a lot of these young players are getting a go. And we're seeing it with some of the other um, clubs as well. I know Perth Glory have picked up a couple of NPL players. But um, what did you did you see the um, Central Coast Mariners game? And the post-match press conference with um, Qual, what was his name? The um, the um, uh, Alo oh, yeah. Qual from the boy um, from uh, Golden Valley Shepparton. Suns. Yeah, yeah. Oh, how good was that? Seriously, like that's you know that's the type of characters we need in mm. the um, in the A League. Um, his post-match press conference was just brilliant. You know, it's like he'd been rehearsing it for a while, but uh, a very colourful character, and that's the sort of people we need in the A League. But look, getting back to Western United. Um, first game in what is it, 140 days, or if I, if I'm, yeah. I may stand corrected. But um, look, all in all, I thought it was a it was a good game. Um, yeah, victory, you know, they've lost a lot of players. They've got a few injuries and that sort of stuff. So you know, what is it? You know, have they got much to play for? I don't know, but certainly Western United have got a lot to play for. They can mm. still make the top six. In fact, they're in a good position to do so. Um, and they could finish as high as fourth, possibly third, depending on how they go in the remaining games. But, uh, um, mate, your thoughts? Uh, look, I think, well, they've got a very tough run of uh, congested um, uh, fixtures uh, sort of in a short amount of time. So the key uh, will be just keeping uh, their players fit and healthy. And if they can do that, I think they will make the finals, yes. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Should be quite interesting. But uh, what what other what other news is happening, mate? Okay, over to Italy now. And Juventus have won the Serie A title for a ninth successive season after goals from Cristiano Ronaldo and Federico Bernardeschi earned a two 0 win at home to Sampdoria. Uh, when contacted by the Geelong Region Soccer Show, friend of the program Santino Mamone is said to be delighted with this impressive feat. Tonchi. Yeah, we've got some got got some footage just for Santino. Um, I'm sure he'll enjoy this. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and um, yeah. as that article you shared with me earlier, Tonchi, they are going for the uh, longest streak of consecutive titles in a uh, national league that is currently held by uh, Barte Borisov and uh, Rosenberg of um, Belarus and uh, Norway, respectively, if I'm correct. Yeah, I, I did see something on social media earlier today. Um, and um, I think if we can if we can actually find it, it'll be uh, um, we will put it up on on screen. But um, here we go. Um, this is the one. Um, if we just uh, move all that stuff there. You, you, so Juventus scored um, their ninth uh, straight Scudetto with a 2-0 victory over Sampdoria on Sunday, equaling run set by Celtic and Rangers. That run puts them level with the likes of Celtic, Rangers, CSK, Sofia, Dinamo Kiev and Ludogorets. The longest title runs are held by Bate Borisov and Rosenborg, who won their domestic league title 13 years in a row from 26 to 2018 and 1992 to 2004, respectively. Dinamo Zagreb won 11 in a row from 2006 to 2016, while Dinamo Tbilisi 
to Bielsi. Bielsi. <laughs> Claimed, yeah, <laughs> that's the one. Claimed the, 10 to be uh, the Georgians. Yes, yes. Claimed 10 titles from 1990 to 1999. The only club keeping pace with Juventus in Europe is Bayern Munich, who recently wrapped up their eighth consecutive Bundesliga crown. Now, when you put that into perspective, that's quite, 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 um, quite an amazing feat, isn't it, Steve? Oh, it is. Yeah, you think at some point along the way it's going to turn pear shape for these teams, and they can't back it up when the uh, when you become the hunted, when you're the uh, title holders. But um, in these cases, well, I don't know if it's necessarily good or bad because it, you know, as we've seen in Germany, people have got almost a bit sick of um, Bayern Munich at times just winning everything yeah. and taking the players. So, um, but but it's also a good story. It's a good piece of history. So, um, glad to see Santino smiling today about that one. It's really uh, <laughs> good good story. So, hello to all of our uh, friends out there wearing the black and white today. Yeah. Now, um, something about okay. Croc Media on the weekend. Like last night, we we, we broke this news as well on um, on the football fan zone. And our friend um, and co colleague um, Craig Filer was calling it the Crocker boop, media. <laughs> but um, they, the Goliaths, went up against David, our old um, stomping ground FNR Football Nation Radio, in the courts and lost. Tell us more, Steve. <laughs> That's right. The headline is Football or Soccer Croc Media Takes the Argument to the Law and Losers. Uh, popular newsbreaker Craig Hutchison whose media network, Croc Media, which runs the AFL Nation network, tried to block Melbourne internet radio station, Football Nation Radio, from registering its name as a trademark because the two might be confused. Croc Media essentially tried to argue that in Australia, the name AFL is synonymous with the term football and that the public would not be able to distinguish between the brands AFL Nation and Football Nation Radio the two different sports they cover. However, uh, hearing officer Robert Wilson, a delegate of the Registrar of Trademarks in Australia, recently ruled otherwise. Wilson has allowed FNR to trademark its name despite Croc Media's protestations. He has also ordered Croc Media to cover FNR's legal costs. Um, so big hello to all of our friends at FNR. And we, uh, yeah, we do miss coming up and seeing you guys up at Docklands every uh Every week, despite the um, <laughs> the uh, icy stop at the tram stop afterwards on our way home, <laughs> <laughs> it was it was. But uh, yeah, look, common sense prevails. The judgment ruled. Uh, it's, it says in the article there, um, the judgment ruled that there are a number of football codes in Australia, such as rugby league and union, Ga Gaelic football and American football, and that ultimately, in my view, the term football is not equivalent to AFL. Um, you know, as I, as we said. Um, Common sense prevails, but uh, you know, this is the thing anyone that's ever stepped foot in in New South Wales, in particular, um, and to an extent, Queensland, you know, pick up the Daily Telegraph, pick up the you know, um, the Courier Mail, or whatever it is up in, in, in Brisbane, you'll be looking back at page 16, 17 from the back to find AFL. Um, all right, maybe I'm exaggerating a little there, but you know, you get the picture, you know what I'm talking about. In other words, AFL is not the bee's knees north of the border, you know, that, that the AFL thinks it is down here. So, you know, um, it's 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 a good win, or you know, albeit a, a uh, maybe a, well, it's not a small win, it's a big win, but but you know, in the in the greater scheme of things, we've still got a massive, massive job to try and promote our sport. It may take a generation or two or maybe three generations, but we're still always going to be that, that poorer brother. Um, but hopefully, hopefully, maybe even with something like this, things will change. But uh, is that weird? Anyway, anyway. <laughs> oh, well, as FNR have done, just keep putting your best foot forward and um, it will hopefully stand you in good stead. Now, back in Geelong, the, uh, the new girls under 18 league is making news in the last week uh, in great news to come from the Football Victoria Competitions Department during last week with the proposed under 18 girls uh, youth league being fast-tracked and coming into fruition over uh, the weekend, which ma matches were played on Saturday. So stay tuned to our results service later in the program to hear the score lines from those fixtures. But a good bit of news there and uh, making the most of the age brackets that are allowed to play football at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. And look, there was, there was, it's a six-team league. Um, expressions of interest went out, what, a month ago, or the, if that? 
Um, they were given about two weeks. Clubs were given about two weeks to, to you know, put in an expression of interest. And then a week later, fixtures were drawn up and, and the uh, league's kicked off. Galaxy United, North Geelong Warriors, who've got two teams, Barwon Heads, Lara United and Bell Park. You know, absolutely fantastic. Well done to all of those clubs. That's, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure that something like that may well... You know, in the future, um, expand to include other clubs as well. It's a shame there isn't an under-16 league, but um, I guess because of the fact that there isn't an under-16 league, a lot of those under-16 teams would have would be taking part in this competition. I know definitely North Geelong won. One of the North Geelong Warriors team is, in fact, the um, under-16 team. So mm. it's great to see that happening. And, and look, um, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those feel-good stories in, in what has been a tough and turbulent year. But um, speaking of tough and turbulent years, our, our next guest, well, he's uh, <laughs> he's really had a tough and turbulent year, hasn't he? Uh, he has. He stepped in right at a uh, time when you could forgive him for wanting to step away, actually. But uh, full credit to Mike McKinster for stepping in as the chair of the, the GRFC at this time. And I think if you can get through this year, you can get through anything, right, would you say, Tonchi? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, with, with, with that in mind, let's bring the great man onto the show and uh, let's uh, let's see what he has to say. Mike, welcome to the Geelong Region Soccer Show. It's, uh, we're in a festive mood. It's our 50th anniversary. Ain't no corona going to knock us down. <laughs> I, I'm hoping that you're, you're in just as a happier mood. Yeah, absolutely. Congratulations. 50 episodes. That's brilliant. So well done. Well done. <laughs> Now you're in a, a happy mood, not just because of that, but also the um, culmination of the EPL over the uh, English Premier League season over the weekend. You know, Liverpool on top, and you're a mad Liverpool supporter, so you, you must am. be happy as well. Yeah, I probably got bags under my eyes. I was up this morning <laughs> watching the game against Newcastle. So, uh, for those that didn't know, we went down one 0 within the first minute. So, but we brought it back in one three one. So, uh, yeah, yeah, delighted, absolutely yeah. delighted. Ah, that's the way. That's the way. Now, mate, let's let's first of all start with um with the Geelong Region Football Committee. When we first um had you on the show, or oh, going back about six weeks ago, or thereabouts, um, we, we both said we all said that we were looking forward to you coming back and giving us a bit of an update. And um, you know, it's is it has it been a hundred days? It's probably it hasn't been, but you know, usually uh, not quite. Yeah. Not quite. Prime ministers or presidents, they usually deliver their hundred day <laughs> report, or you know, um, we, we'll assume it is. So, uh, <laughs> mate, what's been happening in the first few first few months or weeks of of, of your tenure as the um, chairperson of the Geelong Region Football Committee? Yeah, look, it's been really weird. I mean, I, I, when Jo uh, Plummer and I said that she wanted to step back a little bit and I, I said, I'm happy to step up and be the chair. Um, I had all these plans in my head. We were going to have lots of communication, lots of dialogue, lots of meetings, all that sort of stuff. Of course, at that point in time, COVID went nuts. Um, and basically, to, although we're still not in the same position as Melbourne, but most people are still effectively in lockdown. And so all of that contact with the clubs that I'd originally had in my head and contact with other people, quite frankly, it hasn't happened. Or if it has, it's been on Zoom. And that's not as effective as face-to-face. -face. But look, we're in a whole new world and we've just got to adjust. So yeah, in that sense, it's been disappointing. But I'm hopeful that as and when the games start to play, like you mentioned earlier, you got the juniors, you got the under-18 girls. As people get back on the field, people's morale starts to lift. And uh, good on you for, for keeping it out there. Um, Mike, it's a, obviously a great thing that the juniors in the region have been allowed to continue playing. Um, yeah. yeah. How, how has that been from a point of view of the committee? Is people pretty excited about that? And also, have you been getting around to the uh, venues and seeing some of the games in your local area as well? Well, I'm conscious of the fact that, as you know, there's pretty strict conditions. And, uh, and look, the hard work's actually not done by GRFC. Let's be honest, the hard work's done by the clubs. Um and, and all the volunteers of the clubs. And of course, as you know, with the social distancing rules and all of that, what they don't want is, you know, guys like me wandering up and adding to that, thinking, who's this guy here? What's he doing? And, and how do you keep... So to, to a large extent, no, I haven't. Um, I really miss that, Steve, because I really love it, particularly when you get out to see the kids and the excitement that they generate. I'm hopeful that we remain um, in a position that we are in Geelong and that all of us can get along and support our local clubs more than they have. So no, in front of me, it's, it's there to happen, but uh, I haven't unfortunately up to now been able to do that. I don't want to put pressure on the volunteers. And I know there's a lot of pressure on volunteers trying to work out all the rules and regulations that are keeping people safe. 
Yeah. Now we know that um, uh, Football Victoria Club Ambassador Foddy Kiprim does a great job getting around and contacting and all, all the clubs. And, yeah. and, and no doubt he obviously works qu fairly close with you, Joe, and um, the rest of the crew there. Yeah. But, um, but but have you have you really had a chance much to 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 have any dialogue or chats or you know formal or informal with some of the other clubs around the region? How are they going? I mean, we've spoken to a few of the clubs and even here on air. Um, but obviously, we, we don't get around to all of the clubs. What is the general feeling about about the state of football, you know, with or without coronavirus here in Geelong? Yeah, look, I mean, it's, I mean, obviously we meet through the GRFC meetings and we have the presidents on the calls and the next one's on Monday, the 3rd of August. So there's a lot of dialogue happens through that. But um, I also almost on the contact with Foddy almost every day. I haven't ring him today, so I owe him a phone call. But we're almost on the phone all the time. And of course, he's on the ground and he feeds back to me and keeps me connected with what the sense is on the ground. I think there's a bit of frustration um, in the sense that people just want to get on the field and play um, and although the clubs have now started to get back and do a little bit of training um, that's really begin to I guess have an impact because I know that I think sometimes we fall in a little bit of a trap in football generally and a lot of sports where we become very very focused on the competition side of it and don't get me wrong we're all competitive so that's really really yeah. important but the social side of football is really important and, and the mental well-being of people is really important. So I think we've got to make sure we keep that balance right. And, and I think there's a sense of frustration that I pick up from some of the clubs about, you know, what, can we get clarity over this and clarity over that? And we'll talk about the refund policy potential in a minute mm -hmm. um, and the collaboration between Football Victoria. Um, it's a very difficult circumstance for everybody and I, I sense there's a bit of frustration because people just want to get on and we want things to go back to normal but of course the reality is that's not going to happen in the short term it's not going to happen potentially ever in the future it will be different so I, that said though when you do see some of the little you know little bits of light coming through like you said earlier now uh, with the girl under 18 girls and you start to see some sense of normality coming back in I think you start to see morale uh, beginning to lift and that's that's encouraging yeah, no, like definitely, like um, uh, let, well, let's talk about the um the the refund policy because that's one of the big topics. I mean, I know yeah. with the football out west show um and the clubs in in particularly in Western Melbourne in any Melbourne in general um and and obviously Geelong, one of the big things has been will we have a season? Will we not have a season? We've seen in yeah. Melbourne, obviously, the the season is is off both at senior. Um, level at the, at this stage and possibly the junior level um, indefinitely. But in Geelong, we're lucky. We've sort of got half the club's operations, those junior ones, are still proceeding. The senior ones are on hold. Um, but the, um, the the question of refunds always rears its um, pretty little head. Uh, I'm going to be positive today. <laughs> Tell us about the meeting last Wednesday with um, with Football Victoria and, and, and the Geelong clubs. And... Um, and Really, how did that all, all proceed? How did that eventuate? Sure. Uh, well, what had happened was that we, we clearly were aware from, as we were talking about earlier, the feedback that you pick up from on the ground, um, that, that people are wanting to know what's going on, you know, um, and we all want to know, you know, what's happening with the with the fees. Is there a refund going to be coming? So we, we contacted Football Victoria and said, look, on behalf of all of the clubs in Geelong, can we organise a kind of extraordinary meeting? to have a bit of a conference call about it and actually talk through the issues. Now, behind the scenes, I'd been talking separately with Football Victoria already, but said, look, I think we should go and talk to the clubs. Um, and it was good in the sense that um, Football Victoria wanted to go through consultation. They didn't want to just go and say, bang, here's the refund policy. We've thought about it. This is our view of life, and here it is. Take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. they, they actually wanted to reach out and get input from the clubs as to what that refund policy might look like. Now, I know that there was a sense of frustration on some of the clubs that joined the call because they just wanted an answer. You know, what is the refund policy? What is it? And of course, at this point in time, Football Victoria said, well, we haven't finalized it yet. Part of the process we're going through now is to get your input before we do that. But what they have done is they've committed to put out that policy at the beginning of August. So at least as a time frame from when we, we would know it. And uh, I'm not going to speak on behalf of Football Victoria. They've got to go through the process they've got to go through. But... Um, in the order of about 50% refund was mentioned. Um, now whether that's where it ends up after consultation, I'm not sure, but that was the kind of numbers that were talked about. And uh, I think where the clubs are at now, at least we now have a timeline and we know when there'll be clarity one way or the other. 
Um, and I think that's that's a good thing. And I think the fact that Football Victoria are consulting in a difficult circumstance, because, you know, GRFC, as you know, uh, almost wears two hats. On the one hand, there's you advocate on behalf of the Geelong clubs, so you're <laughs> sort of in discussion with Football Victoria, and we're appropriate, you're challenging Football Victoria. And then the other hat you put on is about the wider stance of football in Victoria, particularly the organisation, and how do we work collectively? Um, so we've got to try and make it work. And at the moment, they, these are uncharted waters for everybody. So they're in a bit of a, going through a tough time. Um, they've got a lot of staff, as you would know, uh, Tonchi, from your personal contacts that are around, are they being stood down? You know, some of them are not job keeper, like every other organization that's out there. It's really tough. Um, so whilst it's easy for us, if we put our club hats on and our GRFC hat on, to just say, I wish bloody football Victoria would just get off their ass and make a decision. They've, they've gone through a tough time. And I think if we just end up, as can happen in circumstances like this, in a pandemic, you see how certain countries unify and certain countries divide. I mean, look at New Zealand and the leadership there, how that's unified. Look at America and the way that's divided it. And for mm-hmm. me, we've got to unite. Uh, we'd rather be the New Zealand, if you like, from a GRFC, Football Victorian club, rather than Trump. and Because otherwise, it's just going to fall into chaos. Well, it's uh, interesting you talk about division and u- unity, you know, um, you, you, and you talked about Foddy. You know, you're a big Celtic man and Foddy's a big uh-huh. Rangers fan. What hope yeah. does Geelong football have then had? <laughs> <laughs> you were saying earlier that the UV have finally caught up and equaled the record of the Celtic and Rangers, so there you yeah. go. So. There you go, yeah. But uh, no, all jokes aside, all jokes aside, and, um, and it, it is good to see that um, at least in some things. And, and I, look, I'd like to think that Geelong football, Geelong, the Geelong football community has in many ways um, punched above its weight with the Absolutely. resources we've had. Um, yep. and, you know, you, you look at, you look at, and also the, 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 the growth of the game in the last four or five years and the numbers. Um, yep. And Foddy, Foddy was telling me a few, a few months ago, if it wasn't for the coronavirus, the records would have been broken yeah, um, as far absolutely. as participation. And that's, you know, we're probably looking at five and a half, edging up towards 6,000, which is an insane amount. When I know when I when I started this um, page, Geelong Region Soccer News Facebook page in 2015, it was done because there was hardly any publicity in Geelong. At the time, there was, I think it was just a tad over 2,500 players playing. So, you know, we've come a long way and we sometimes forget that. But- yeah, absolutely huge. And look, I mean, you know, as in all walks of life, 2020 is going to be a really tough year for all sorts of reasons. And the way I'm sort of thinking about it, probably like a lot of people out there, yes, it's tough and we've got to get through the current circumstance, but we've got to keep planning for next year and the year after because, you know, John football is in really good shape, like you said, um, and there's a lot of good things going on out there. So I just hope that we don't all descend into the here and now and lose sight of the fact that we're planning ahead. Yeah, we've got to do all the short-term things. And uh, even the other week, as you might know, I was down with 40 uh, getting the goals ready for the under nines and the under twelves, the Howard Glover, packing them up, and putting them in bags, and numbering all the damn things, so that when they went back out, it meant it was easy for the clubs to reassemble the goals and get going. So there's all that grassroots stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's some great news that we've had uh, some feedback recently. Uh, Western United helped put in a proposal for a grant uh, to get some funding for some training uh, of coaches which has now been awarded. Um, so there's five Fantastic. grand, which is going to be... So they've done a great job uh, uh, working with the GRFC, applied for the grant. We've got the five grand. We're now just working through with 40. How do we then put together a program, whether we look at juniors um, and looking at the coaching at that level? Because we all know, everybody on the call here who's into football, if you get the grassroots right at that younger age, then you, your quality in the later years of, you know, when kids get to 14, 18, that's when they really shine. But you've got to get in early. So... There's some things like that that are all the little small wins and victories along the way. And like you said earlier, we've got to shout from the rooftops when they come. Bad news travels fast, but good news, you've got to shove uphill. So there's just one example. Yeah. Now, it looks like we've lost Steve, unfortunately. I don't know where he is. He's going to ask the next question. But uh, nonetheless, um, Mike, for those that aren't aware of the Geelong Region Football Committee and how it actually operates... Yep. Do you mind? Do you mind giving us a bit of a rundown as to what the organisation is, how how it operates, what are some of its limitations, and also what is its main purpose? I guess. Yeah, well, look, it's it's a bit different from some of the other um, associations that are available or or, or around the rest of Victoria because it's not an associate, it's not an incorporated association. 
it was actually a bylaw uh, of Victoria, the Vic, Football Victoria, Football Federation Victoria at the time, 10 years ago. Um, and GRFC was established. And I guess the idea was to act as a advisory and advocacy body, advising FV based on inputs from all the clubs locally. What are the issues in the area? How do we coordinate things uh, at the Football Federation level? Um, and also at the local level. So we act as a bit of a broker, I guess. We advocate on behalf of the clubs, um, but we also work collaboratively with FV. But it's all about the common objective of trying to grow the game here in Geelong. Um, so in that sense, the clubs are the, the clubs are the most important part. It's you know we've got to be supporting the clubs as GRFC, listening to what the feedback is from the clubs, and then saying to Football Victoria, what can we do about this? What can we do to improve it? And we can do that individually, one on one, with clubs talking to Football Victoria, or we can try and pull it collectively and say, right, how do we try and make sure that the whole game in the whole region benefits? Then it's better if we coordinate that. So the GRFC, in that sense, tries to represent the clubs but also tries to then, um, you know, make sure that Football Victoria are involved in the planning of the game going forward. Steve, we've got you back. We lost you for a second, but uh, it's good <laughs> yeah, to have you uh, back. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, completely dropped out. Um, I hope I didn't, I'm not repeating anything that was said while I was off air, but uh, Mike, um, great news winning the uh, Women's World Cup for 2023 for both us and uh, New Zealand. Uh, there a big talk around the committee of trying to get uh, hosting a team for their training base in the Geelong region? Well, look, it's, it's early days yet, um, but there's been a number of things that have been mentioned. That's one of them. Um, but nothing's from as, as at this point in time. I think, like you said, Steve, the main thing at the moment is to celebrate what a huge success that's Some of that into the Geelong region and get uh, Geelong's name out there um, as a place where football was really moving forward, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I mean, I know there has been talk around the traps that different clubs are talking about, yeah, um, putting in bids and what you're not. But I guess one of the key things then in that particular case would be infrastructure. And, and um, I guess um, over the last few years, we've had quite a fair bit of money from council, yep. state government poured into various, um, even to an extent federal government, poured into various facilities around the region. But it, it just doesn't seem to be enough, mate, if, if that's the right word. Um, I know Councillor Kylie Grisbeck and Councillor Eddie Contell have come on this show and they've said that they would really want to see a regional or a sub-regional facility. Kylie went so far as to say one with a 5,000-seat grandstand that can host FFA Cup games, pre-season matches, yep. maybe even W League, Y League games. Uh, has there been much collaboration between GRFC and, and maybe the Geelong Council or, or, or at least facilitating something with Football Victoria and the Geelong Council to go down that path and explore those uh, possibilities? Yeah, look, we're we're just entering a phase, uh, Tonshi, where we're going to kind of update our strategic plan. I think it's important that um, GRFC and all the clubs as best they can have some sort of sense of what's their longer term plan. Uh, and you know what it's like, it's a bit like infrastructure in Victoria. Sometimes the growth, you know, ends up uh, exceeding the infrastructure and you end up behind. So we're now, like as is happening at the moment, putting in roads, rail, networks and the like to try and keep up with population growth that we're chasing it. Mm -hmm. And and to some extent, it's a bit like that here in Geelong with, um, with football. But we're sort of kind of victims of our own success. Just as we put in enough facilities to get to where we want to be, the game grows again. Yeah, but, which is a great problem to have, isn't it? Um, so mm. I, I, the good news is that what hasn't happened is that we haven't had a, a, a moratorium on spending. And uh, the council have been very active and it's been great having people like Kylie involved because she's involved directly with the council. Um, so she can be a voice and an advocate directly there. But you've also got the other politicians have been stepping up, as you know, John Aaron and others are very keen on the game. And the more we keep the uh, the game out there and the people know how successful in the future we're going to be in the projected growth and that's why we want to redo um, the strategic plan because the population growth and, and the requirements for the game going forward are really really important that we, we plan for because you know otherwise again we're going to be behind catching up with infrastructure yeah and we don't, we don't, and we certainly yeah. don't want to be doing that that's for sure and it's not only the hardware, um, I, I call it the software. I think we talked about it the last time. We've also got to invest in coaches. We've also got to invest in referees. Um, so it's not all about just the facilities. We've got to have the right skilled people there supporting the clubs. And again, I, I particularly have a bit of a soft spot 
by saying grassroots starts at the junior level and at the kids level, get that right and build it from there. Um, not to ignore everything else, but you, but if you don't do that right, then it's it's yeah, you're not on solid foundation. Mm. Yeah. Um, still on facilities, is there any scope for the committee to liaise directly or indirectly with the land developers around the region? Like, um, for instance, if you look out at Armstrong Creek and Mount Denise and Charlemont, there's still no football facilities out there, but there's like three Australian rules ovals. Um, I was out having a walk around fin Jen Finesford uh, last weekend and then they're chucking in a, an oval there, very oval shaped and putting up the footy goalposts and all that sort of stuff. Um, it would just be nice to see some rectangular fields like they put in at the estuary that where Leopold play, for instance, um, yeah. in some of the growth areas going in, at least um, to match with some of the amounts of footy fields. I'm not saying that they can't build footy fields, but at least if there was a bit less of a yeah. disparity, it would be nice to see. Yeah, again, I think that's a really good call, Steve. And I think we, a bit like I was saying earlier, we've got to do that, I think, in collaboration with other bodies, whether that be the Council, Football Victoria and others. Uh, but the developers we've got to engage with because they, they, they might think that they're doing the right thing when they're putting up uh, all the facilities that they are. But, you know, that they're, if they're not catering for our game amongst others, then we're missing out. So I actually think that's an opportunity that's still there. I think that's something that we should push harder. Now, we're speaking with the Geelong Region Football Committee GRFC Chairman Mike McKinstry about a lot of things locally here in football and some of the um, the trials and tribulations of, of his chairmanship in, the, in, a, in, a, in a rather difficult year. But, uh, um, Mike, there's been talk about, look, the, one of the, uh, the positives that we have in Geelong, one of the advantages, I guess, is that probably three quarters of the clubs have got football-specific pitches or at yeah. least access to football-specific pitches. There was talk about having a revamped um, 2020 only um, senior competition, men's and women's, that would be just for the Geelong region, possibly, possibly spreading out to Ballarat. Um, what's what's the latest with regards to that? Because that was originally sort of expressions of interest were sought from Football Victoria themselves or the competitions department. Um, what's been sort of the early kind of uh, thinking about that? Yeah, well, as you said, expressions of interest went out. Uh, we had a number of clubs that came back and said, yeah, they are interested. Um, and it's something that we, we're actively engaged with Football Victoria on, obviously subject to COVID and all of those things. But uh, there's a, there is interest um, in doing just that, um, which, again, uh, I think would be really good for Geelong. People just want to get on the field and play. Um, so if we can get that up and running as soon as possible, I'd love that. And so it's something that we're, we're actively got on the agenda with uh, Football Victoria. It's not finalised yet, but I think it's an opportunity. Steve, any more questions for our guest tonight? Uh, no, that's a wrap from me, actually, Tonchi, unless you've got any more to add. But I would add myself that it would be good to see that competition get off the ground if it's at all possible. But, of course, yeah. um, at the moment, I guess it's a case of fingers crossed. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and people just want to get out and play the game, you know? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And look, with the juniors, it is it is a blessing. And, and I'm involved personally, uh, both as a parent and as a coach. And I'll tell you what, you know, when, when you see win, lose or draw, you just see the kids are so excited. The parents are grateful. Um, you know, we, we, are, we are very blessed, at least here in Geelong for the time being. So hopefully absolutely. that can continue. Yeah, look, I mean, as we talked before on this last time when I came on the call, you know, the thing that... We ought not to forget in any sport, but, you know, football, just like, you know, AFL and other sports, you know, the, the impact that they have on holding the community together is really important. And that whole community aspect is something that's really, really important. And Tonja, you would know that, for example, I spent some time with my old hat on when I was at Gen U uh, pushing yep. things like all abilities soccer and all abilities football. So um, if we can get, you know, that up and running, uh, as, then again, we'll just keep our communities together. And that's really, really important. Absolutely. On that note, uh, Mike, we wish you all the very, very best for the rest of the year and indeed um, the rest of your term as a mandate as GRFC chairperson. And uh, we look forward to once again having you on few months in a few months' time with um, um, even more positive news, let's say that, even more yeah. positive news than we've got now. Yeah, well, well done. Good on you. That was Thanks, uh, Mike. Mike McKinstry, the GRFC chairperson, um, joining us here on the football um, Geelong Region Soccer News, uh, soccer show, I rather. Um, it's our 50th anniversary, 50th show anniversary, episode 50. Um, mate, um, we've got a lot coming on on the show um, 
And what else have we got after the break, Steve? It's the doyen of the uh, Geelong football region himself. It's Mr. Roy Hay. And welcome back to the Geelong Region Soccer Show. And we'll just go around the grounds now to Central Coast Stadium, where it is currently nil-nil in the match between the Central Coast Mariners and the Western Sydney Wanderers. And Jordan O'Doherty has just picked up a yellow card in that one. Now, let's have a look at some of those fixtures that were played out in the final round of the EPL last night. And it was Chelsea securing their Champions League spot with a 2-0 win over Wolves. And Man United did enough to claim that fourth spot as well with their win over Leicester, two goals to nil. Southampton, bit of a surprise result there, 3-1 over Sheffield United. Uh, the Blades, who'd had a, quite a good season. Uh, Liverpool had to come from a goal from behind to uh, beat the Newcastle side there, uh, three goals to one. And Aston Villa doing enough to stay up a 1-1 uh, draw with West Ham. And uh, for the Aussie angle there, uh, Matt Ryan and Aaron Moy, Brighton having a 2-1 win over Burnley. And it was uh, Watford getting up three goals to two against, um, sorry, Arsenal getting up three goals to two against Watford. Uh, Man City, a uh, 5-0 route over Norwich, uh, the relegated side that finished at the foot of the table. Palace and uh, Tottenham in a 1-1 uh, all London clash there and um, it was also relegated Bournemouth getting up with a 3-1 win over Everton so it was an uh, action-packed final day of the season in the EPL there just a confirmation there Liverpool on top with 99 points that is a uh, very big very big number and a relegated sides uh, Bournemouth in 18th Watford in 19th and Norwich in 20th place, we'll play championship football next season. Looking forward to seeing the uh, the playoffs now to see who else gets in along with uh, Leeds and uh, West Brom next season, Tonchi. Yeah, no, it should be should be good. And it, it doesn't, you know, there's not much of a break. It's going to get um, up and running very, very shortly. So I'll tell you what, if, uh, if, if they do bring on another lockdown, at least we'll have the <laughs> EPL, we'll have the A-League, um, we'll, we'll, we'll become right royal couch potatoes. But... Uh, you know, that's talking about the future of what may be. But, um, mate, that's right. we're now going to turn our attention and talk about history, the golden age of futsal, the golden age of indoor soccer here in Geelong. And, and on the line, we've got the um, the doyen of the local football community. Um, the, the, he's our local historian um, um, and, um, you know, former Deakin University academic, a man who needs – very, very little um, introduction. It's Roy. Hey, Roy, how are you? Welcome to the Geelong Region Soccer Show. Thanks very much, Tonsi. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, Roy, um, firstly, it's it's great having you on on the show. Um, but I guess one of the catalysts is probably a little bit of a a little bit of a sad um, uh, reason why I suppose, and that's because um, um, last week we had the passing. Of, of a man who was an absolute um, legend around the, um, the the football circles here in Geelong, and that was um, Jeff Williams. We mentioned him a little bit earlier in the show. Um, and, um, you know, what, what was your recollections of, 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 um, of Jeff? Well, I got to know him through the growth of indoor uh, soccer in Geelong, um, I mean, I knew of him uh, because he was one of the stars of uh, the Geelong Football Club in the 1950s, long before we came to Australia. Um, and uh, I met this rather mature gentleman, and he certainly was a gentleman, um, a very gentle man. And... Uh, he had, at that point, got involved with um, indoor soccer. Uh, and uh, as the game kicked off, at the, we moved from Hamlin Park to uh, the Carrara Leisure Time uh, Centre. Um, and, and Jeff presided over the last 
few years of um, the game before it was taken over by FIFA in 1989. Up until then, um, FIFUSA was the international body. Um, and uh, we had teams in Geelong uh, took part in national competitions. Um, and there was even a national league. And uh, Jeff, I, I think he was surprised himself about how the game took off in Geelong. Um, and uh, although he didn't have a soccer background, he was uh, able to um, look after the game at that time. There's a photo of, of Jeff as we speak on, on the screen. We've got a photo of Jeff. It looks like it was the old leisure to, or the, the old leisure time center, the leisure time center back in older days, um, where he's yep. at the microphone. Um, can you remember? It hasn't that changed photo? too much there. <laughs> no, no, the leisure time. That's for sure. Um, can you remember that particular photo? Um, what, what was? Yes, what was the occasion I, I, of that? I, I remember it well. What? Where, what? What happened at that? What? Where was he addressing? The, like, what was the occasion? Okay. I think that would be one of the presentation nights at the end of the season okay. when you'd be talking to um, uh, the people. Um, I have some other photographs which I think were taken at the same time of the, the teams lining up for um, presentation. And um, as you can see, there's quite a crowd in the background. I mean, in those days particularly when our National League teams were playing, um, the Leisure Time Centre was packed and the atmosphere was absolutely brilliant. Well, we just got some footage of some old photos and uh, there's a uh, looks like a North Geelong team. And then uh, this, is a good, this is a good one. Um, I think it's there of Lucky and Teresi. We've got uh, – who else we've got? We've got Robbie Nogler, Robbie Nogler with a hair. George uh -huh. Domofsky next to him. We've got Peter Stojanovsky next to Lucky and Teresi um, in the front. And um, and there's a there's a there's a bearded chap there to the right of Robbie Nogler. Uh, who's that fella? Um I, I haven't got that in front of me, so I, I can't say for certain who it is. Uh, okay, not a problem. But um we've got we've got quite a few photos there. There's another one now we're just putting up on screen, which we had earlier on um um, on the show, or actually not on the, on our show, it was on the on our Facebook page. And there's a uh, ten strapping young gentlemen, all um, all uh, crowded around the Australian Soccer Weekly. And um, oh yeah, yeah, we've got the <laughs> Jack Druzik, Steve Perrin, uh, Steve Radojevic, Peter Vanjek in the background. He was an old science teacher of mine. There's Eddie Radojevic. Um, big shout out to Eddie Radojevic, who's provided some footage, rare footage of the Geelong CC Cats, and we'll talk about them a little bit later on, the Geelong CC Cats and, and how they played in the um, the now-defunct National Indoor Soccer League. But uh, we've also got George Domovsky looking with a, a mullet there in a pink top. Uh, right behind him is Steve McAuliffe, a young Steve McAuliffe, and then then Dinko Ulyard um, to his right. And then in the front, Robbie Nogler, once again with hair. I'm sure Robbie will like that photo. And uh, Peter Stojanovsky, Right next to him, so uh, some uh, from some very very famous faces, that's for sure. Um, um, having been included in the past, but uh, no incredible photos there, mate. Uh, let's go back to now talking about the um, uh, when um, the Geelong CC Cats played. Tell us, tell us a little bit about how that all came about. How at one stage Geelong had some of the best indoor soccer players in Australia. We did. Uh, I mean, the game began in, in New, uh, really in an organised form in New South Wales at Reevesby. Um, and a fellow called Joe Brent, who had a background in uh, wrestling, um, was one of the movers and shakers at that time. And uh, Ian Whitten of Buffalo Sports began to sponsor the game. Um, and uh, what was going on in Geelong was uh, really just um, local games, but gradually we began to link up with the uh, Victorian and then the national bodies. Um, 
and uh, put teams into um, Australian uh, competitions, um, national championships, uh, and then in in the late eighties um, we uh, started playing in uh, the indoor national league. Um, a team called the Geelong CC's Cats um, played. Um, and uh, there were some great occasions. And uh, I think you mentioned already, in 1988, we actually hosted one of the venues for um, the last of the um, futsal um, a, a, a World Cups yep. under FIFUSA. Um, and uh, that took place at the arena. Um, and uh, we had uh, uh, two players from uh, Geelong, Robbie Nogler and Lucky Interisi, in the Australian team that took part in that. Um, so uh, the game was really uh, taking off at that time, and uh, it, uh, it just so happened that the game then was taken over by, by FIFA, and uh, uh, things uh, fell away, certainly in Geelong after that. Now, uh, Geelong, as you said, the CC Cats, and, and they're looking resplendent in their orange and yellow uh, kits there. I guess um, uh, the, the, the colour scheme was, was pretty much, they look like a CC chip packet. And uh, <laughs> and uh, we've got Steve Radojevic, Eddie Radojevic, a young um, Steve McAuliffe. Um, playing in there, lucky and Teresi in goals as well. So it's incredible footage that we're seeing in front of us. They're, that's they're playing against. I think it was the the Sydney Spartans from um, from Sydney, um, obviously. Um, James Hardy Industries. They were the backers of of the um, the indoor soccer league, the National Indoor Soccer League back then. And um, am I am I right in saying Robbie Nogler, Geelong's Robbie Nogler, was in fact voted the Player of the Year in that particular? Um, campaign 1987. Is, is, is that right, Roy? Roy? Well, he certainly was. I, I, I'm sure that was correct that he did win the, the National Player of the Year because he was absolutely outstanding. Um, and uh, I mean, just uh, very young. Um, there were a lot of skillful players around, um, but uh, Robbie had that lovely mixture of very good individual skills, um, but uh, also uh, was was absolutely lethal in front of goal, um, and therefore caught the eye and, and thoroughly deserved the accolades he got. We just saw a young Steve McAuliffe. I think he was 17 years of age at the time, launching what looked like would have been called an old toe buster. And uh, managing to score an equaliser there, uh, um, Steve. Steve played at was it Geelong Rangers um, or was it Bell Park? I can't quite remember. Well, but... uh, he he started at uh, Rangers, mm -hmm. then he was at uh, Bell Park, and then he had uh, time at North as well. Mm -hmm. um, so he played with uh, several clubs, um, and uh, another ornament to to the game. I mean, a, a Thoroughly decent bloke. His younger brother Jason, who was same age as my son Ross, the pair of them were selected for an Australian under fourteen team and went on tour to America. Um, and uh, the senior team at the same time was also going overseas, and that had Lucky and uh, Robbie in it. So Geelong had. Uh, uh, a significant representation at uh, international level. Now, um, one of our one of our loyal uh, listeners, viewers, Steve Tanich, um, has sent on in uh, another little bit of um, uh, gold. Um, I guess uh, there's a newspaper clipping there of um, 
Now, it, it was um, the Australian champions, and, and we'll try and read this. The Geelong under-15 indoor soccer team has become the Australian champion side after a playoff in Canberra recently. The Bell Park Strikers won the national under-15 title over the Australia Day weekend when they beat the reigning champions, a team from New South Wales. The Strikers were pitted against teams from all states except of Australia and the Northern Territory except WA. Strikers were then coached by uh, Mr. Jim Zadkovich and managed by his wife, Alfie. Uh, during the champion national titles in Canberra, four of the strikers players were chosen for the under-15 Australian indoor soccer squad, which will tour New Zealand in August. Chosen for the Australian squad were Robert Nogla and Joseph Zadkovich, both of Bell Post Hill, and Jerry Graluk and Vlado Semyoniv, both of Bell Park. Now, that under-15s team that went on to become national champions um, they had players such as Alex Berta, the enigmatic Zoran Rosso, Steve Tanich, uh, Robin Ogla, Patrick Alilovic, uh, Vlado Semenev, Daniel Krasik, who is today involved with the referees, and Mario Kovac. So some um, very, very talented young men back in those days. And look, um, when, we, when we think about it, it was such a um, um, a, a, a breeding ground, wasn't it? Geelong was such a breeding ground, but it wasn't just um, um, players and officials and coaches, but we had, we had some pretty good referees as well. Now, one particular young chap, his dad is still involved with the referees, uh, Mitko Nikolovsky, who is um, well into his 70s, but he's still actively involved. The man is incredible. He's a machine. But he's um, one of his sons was actually... Um, uh, a, 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 a nationally recognised um, um, referee. Um, what was his name? Can you remember, Roy? Um, I, I'm struggling to remember who that would be. Yeah, if, um, if anyone can remember, if if, if they're listening, um, type the uh, type the name of uh, Jan Nikolovsky, whatever his name was. Um, um, but he was he was a. Uh, yeah, Ace was it Ace by any chance or something like that? Aye, Archie. Yes. Archie, yes, yes, yes you've yes, got yeah, it. That's right. Yeah. There you go. I've saved everyone the hassle. But um, yeah. So we were we were obviously being well re um, recognised at all levels, um, both you know at a state level and a national level. What what eventually ended up? Well, I mean, futsal as we know now is very very popular um, as a participation sport. And it's slowly starting to um, become, um, you know, at that representative level. But back in the late 80s, early 90s, what suddenly happened that the bottom fell out of um, competitive representative futsal or, or indoor soccer, as was known back then, here in Geelong? Um, well, it, I mean, the game continued. Uh, it, uh, a lot of the juniors moved to the Barron Valley Activity Centre um, and then uh, something we were uh, talking about uh, earlier, um, I, there, there were other attempts to get indoor soccer going in uh, Geelong. Um, and uh, for, for various reasons, sometimes it was a lack of a venue, sometimes... Uh, uh, an attempt at improving the the image of the game backfired um, when Jakobanovic, who um, had set up an indoor centre uh, in Bell Park, and uh, it was going uh, well, and he uh, um, asked, I think. The, um, probably the Geelong News or the Echo to um, uh, do a propaganda piece for him on the the uh, the indoor centre, mm -hmm. um, and because the young and uh, really unaware uh, reporter who went out used some uh, language which was not regarded as appropriate by the Croatian community. Um, that uh, episode really fell apart, and that took a lot of the heart out of the game when that occurred. It's a shame. It's a shame. But um, slowly, as we said, in recent years, we're seeing um, certainly from a participation level, um, futsal is starting to get um, gain more and more popularity. And I guess with um, 
uh, things like the synthetic pitch at Leisure Time Centre, um, um, allowing uh, modified sport to continue in a social sort of a setting. One can only ah. think that that you know certainly um, football or, or modified football here in Geelong is is um, once again going to relive the glory days of of, of yesteryear. But back to Jeff Williams, um, Roy. Um, um, how how long was he involved in in the the Geelong Indoor Soccer Association, and who were some of the other people that were involved in the um in the in the um organisation back then alongside Jeff? Um, Fred Nogler, uh, Robbie's dad, was a pillar of the game. Um, he knew soccer very well himself. I mean, uh, uh, there's a lovely story about. Uh, Fred arriving in uh, in Geelong uh, from uh, Germany, or um, and uh, looking like many migrants, uh, almost as soon as he arrived, looking for a game of soccer, um, and uh, he finished up playing for the old uh, Croatia club, and in his first game. Uh, he couldn't understand his teammates, but he could understand the opposition because they were the Germans from Carrile. <laughs> so um, he only played, I think, one game for North and then moved to uh, Carrile. Um, but uh, obviously uh, he um, was supporting uh, Robbie and Rick, uh, his sons, um, but he took on a, a role as, if you like, the the person who knew the game better um, and hence complemented um, Jeff Williams' other skills, whereas uh, um, the, the pair of them in double harness were really very effective. Um, and the other thing we should say, uh, Tonchi, is yeah. there was a very strong women's competition as well um, yes. at yeah. the Leisure Time Centre. Um, and and uh, the game flourished uh, as, as a, um, a, a, a game for both men and women. Um, and and uh, it really was a pity that uh, we weren't able to sustain the, the very top level that we reached in the late 18, uh, 1980s. Um, now, that's, that's really interesting you say that because... Um, yeah, um, you know, and it's it's. I think uh, Mike McKinstry, the uh, GRFC chairperson, just before you, did mention um, how s soccer in Geelong. It's it's not just about this sport, and it's not the, the clubs themselves are very very much a social element. And we've seen so many absolutely. Yeah, you know, I mean, the Nogglers, for example, and and that's an interesting one. That 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 story there of Fred playing one game at North Geelong, and and now you know you go back. Several decades later, and his um, his um, his um, grandson Jamie is now a staple at North Geelong in the senior team. So it's sort of like the the Nogla family's come full circle. It's it's amazing. I um, mean, that's just oh one, yes, one yeah, and and I mean you know this yourself, Tonchi. I mean the game is a game of families. Mm. Um, you know the number of families around here that. Uh, um, have produced generations of um, players from all the communities. Um, I mean, in some some cases, uh, take the Didalitsas and Radojeviches. I mean, they, they've um, fielded several generations from the 1950s uh, to the present day, and uh, they're. Uh, uh, great grandchildren are now, um, you know, the future of the game in yeah. in this part of the world. And similarly, with many of the Macedonian families um, uh, and uh, other groups as well. Now, you mentioned that there was a thriving um, women's competition back then um, in indoor soccer, um, uh, both at the Leisure Time Centre, and I can certainly remember. Um, at the old roller skating rink or the old roller rollerama down at Stead Park on the where where today um, is KFC and um, McDonald's, but uh, I guess um, in many ways we had um, you know a lot of relationships were were born at the soccer. Now on the on the um, um, screen we've got um, a, a North Geelong team there. And um, look at the legs on those blokes. You know, the <laughs> the shorts are very, very short and they're very, very high. 
and um, some of the girls would say very, very sexy legs, no doubt. And uh, I guess um, you know that was that was the beauty of having a lot of people coming along. Um, you know, and, and and all jokes aside, lots and lots of relationships were born um, because yes. of soccer. Well, th think of uh, two that come to mind uh, straight away: Neil and Joe Plummer. Oh, there we go. <laughs> We, we, we're going to have to we're going to have to tell us that story. But in the meantime, for people who are really interested in finding more about the history of football in Australia and including including a lot of history, um, I'm holding up a book of of yours, Roy, which you co-wrote with Bill Murray, A History of Football in Australia, available at all good bookstores. And where else can you get that online? You can probably get that at um on Amazon Books or something like that. I'm sure. Yes, um, it, it's still the ebook version is still available from Hardy Grant, and it will be available through Amazon and Book Depository and the other places. Unfortunately, the hard um, hard copy is uh, now no longer available. Um, I have uh, thought that, uh, and I'm hoping to turn the thought into reality. Um, uh, Bill and I will try and add um, to the, the, the book uh, to bring it up to date um, with a view to um, launching it at the time when we host the Women's World Cup in 2023. So provided, as my mother-in-law would say, provided we are spared, that's one of the plans we have. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, mate, it's always a pleasure chatting to you, uh, Roy. Um, I guess one last question from me um, is there's been always talk and there's always been talk of, of having a regional facility, uh, um, soccer, a football you know, stadium or a sub-regional stadium, and there's always been talk of having like a centre of Geelong, um, football for Geelong. And I guess the closest we've got to is uh, <laughs> Howard Glover Reserve and the club rooms there. But has there ever been any talk of, of having a – I don't know, a, 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 a fair income dedicated museum to football here in Geelong? And, uh, not as far as the museum is concerned yet. I mean, uh, we've had two or three um, exhibitions uh, of some of the material that would go into any mm -hmm. uh, museum for the game. The uh, first one was at the National Sports Museum in uh, the MCG in Melbourne. Then I had one on the 1967 uh, boys that went to Vietnam and came home with our first international trophy for the game. And that was at the National Museum of Australia in, uh, in Canberra. And last year I had one at... Uh, at Deakin, uh, showcasing mm -hmm. the co wonderful collection of photographs and other material that we have at the university. Um, so there have been a lot of e e exhibitions, but we're still a long way from having uh, a museum. And the advice I get is that we really should look at doing something electronic in the first instance. Um, because... <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me, bricks and mortar are very expensive, and uh, to have uh, people to look after um, the material uh, mm. is also expensive. So I think that's a long way down the track. I know that um, FFA is certainly interested, and at one point I thought that FFV would take over the um the exhibition that we had at uh, at Deakin and uh, put it in their headquarters in in Melbourne but that hasn't come about so far i don't know whether it's likely to do so now um but anyway the the, the that particular exhibition was designed so that it could be moved and shown elsewhere so i've still got the hope that it might happen again. Well, the concept of an electronic museum or, or, or an electronic archive that would be accessible to everyone and that would be there, most importantly, documented, would be um, such an incredible, incredible thing for Geelong because um, 
there has been some great, great stories, great, uh, great, um, um, uh, I guess lots of great stories that have been told over the years and shared on the terraces, but very few have been documented. And there have been a couple, I know the old, I think it was the Migrant Resource Centre or Diversity at the Forerunner, they, they released something that was like um, stories of migrants coming to this city and they had some uh, great stories. It was always seemed to revolve around about soccer. And, and I, I remember reading the book by Steve Horvath Sr., um, which I think we both went to a, to a, to a book launch a few years back where he, where he talked about his arrival here in Geelong and, um, and, and it was all about soccer. It was all about the football. So um, there's been mm. some great stories. Well, unfortunately- while you're talking, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at um, pictures for an exhibition that I have on my uh, computer at the moment, yep. um, including everything from the local game to uh, uh, advertisements for games in Port Phillip in 18, the 1850s, huh. um, uh, Gerd Muller's goal against Australia in 1974, uh, Joe Madunic and one of his mates with uh, half and half Croatian and Australian tops in uh, in Germany in uh, 2006 and so on. Wow. Well, it would be, it'd, it'd be great to see that get the light of day, that's for sure. Yeah, it's got an incredible story to play soccer in in this city, football in this city, and it's also got an incredible future. And um, you know, it's great that we are here at, on the Geelong Region Soccer Show after fifty episodes. Steve able to fuse the past, the present, and the future, and um, look forward to uh, look forward to hearing many, many more great stories, many more great yarns, Roy, and um, certainly um, the idea of an electronic um, museum or an online. Um, uh, yeah, archive is um, for me just absolutely, absolutely tantalising at the prospect. Well, thanks very much for the invitation to be on the show, and uh, more power to your elbow. Keep going, Tonshi. You're doing a grand job. And so, Steve, exactly. All right, that that was Roy. Hey, <laughs> thank you very much for joining us, Roy. We really, really appreciate you joining us, and um, and um. That um, that it's it's the history. Um, um, Steve is is just phenomenal. But um, as we said, the future mm. I think really looks really really bright when we've got so much to draw upon the past, the present, and certainly well and truly the future. You know, you, you build the future based mm. on your past, and if anything's to go by, we um, the sport of football here in Geelong has has got has got a rich past, a f- phenomenal present, and an equally inspiring future to look forward to yeah that's right mate and it was uh, really a good uh, treat to get along to deacon waterfront to see that exhibition last year i think it was around this time last year and yeah, you, probably was, do a bob, it, yeah. you could probably do a bob hawk and say uh, anyone who didn't get along from the football community to check <laughs> that out is a bum because <laughs> it's uh, it yeah. was great it was great and we need to we need to celebrate our history. There's a lot to learn from there. And uh, you, you often watch that show on FNR, the guys put together, if you know your history. And there's some fascinating yeah. stories that, you know, they do regular segments like 100 years ago today. And it's just stuff that people didn't know. And I think the perception is that soccer is a new game in Australia and it's not. And um, I think one of the pillars for success for our game is to, is to uh, obviously be embracing our history. So uh, Roy does that better than anyone. Yeah, now, um, if you talk to Roy, he's got a really interesting story um, of um, how football before, before uh, during the gold rush, it became so popular. It was really, really popular. It had, you know, it had, uh, it was probably headed the way of becoming the national sport here in Australia. Um, and then the, 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 the demise of the gold rush was the catalyst for um, um, AFL um, because that stopped immigration in effect. And that, as a result, um, so this is the mid-19th century, um, as a result of the, mm. the, for about 20 years, immigration effectively stopped. That's when AFL got a boost. And it was because of that, that or VFL or whatever it's called, Australian football, that's when it really became uh, um, ingrained as the main sport. But if, um, you know, if it wasn't for the end of the gold rush, if it wasn't for the the, the cessation of of immigration to this country, 
Soccer could have been the main sport. Who knows? Who knows? Mate, let's uh, talk about um, yeah. recent history and let's talk about the weekend just gone by and um, uh, some of the games. We're going to have to whiz through this very, very quickly. The juniors. Yeah, uh, let's we are over time. That. Yep. Yeah. All right. Will we start with the girls or the boys this week? Oh, we'll let's start the girls off with this the week. Girls. They started on Saturday. So, ladies before gentlemen. Okay, so the girls under 12 from Saturday, there is results. Ballerine Sharks, nil. Bell Park, seven. North Geelong Warriors, seven. Surf Coast, one. Lyra United, four. Golden Plains, one. And Barwon Heads, one. Drysdale, 12. And uh, that's a wrap for the girls under 12s. We'll move into the under 14s. Yep. Uh, the, the girls under 14, so we had Geelong Rangers Blue travelling to Surf Coast where they went down by um, three goals to one. Barn Soccer Club played host to the Drysdale Soccer Club and um, it was the visitors that came away from Grovedale Reserve with all three points, courtesy of a 2-1 two two win. And um, in Barn Heads and Golden Plains did battle out at Barn Heads Reserve and once again it was the visitors that prevailed in this encounter Golden Plains Soccer Club coming returning to Bannockburn with a 4-0 win. Steve, under 18 girls. Yeah, so the new girls under 18 comp that kicked off on the weekend saw Geelong Galaxy United 11, North Geelong Warriors 0, and a Bowen Heads 3, uh, Lara United 2. Um, and the other match, which was scheduled to be between, I think, Bell Park and the other North Geelong Warriors side, uh, didn't eventuate. Tonchi, is that correct? Do you know anything? Uh, about I'm, not, I'm not too sure, but I think I, I only yeah. uh, probably would say that that was postponed or the results did not yeah. come through. Um, yeah. So I, I, I've either. I suspect or, it might have been postponed, but I, yeah. yeah. If anyone uh, knows, put it in the comments. I think it might have been a forfeit, 3 0. It looks yeah. like the 3 0 scoreline has been registered for North Geelong Warriors Red. So I, I, I venture yeah. to say that that was a forfeit. Okay. Moving along to the yeah. uh, boys now. So on the Sunday, we had the boys. Um, the under 12, we'll start off with the Kangaroos slash Wallabies. Um, now we had North Geelong Warriors and Surf Coast Yellow draw 1 1. Surf Coast. Uh, played host to Bell Park. Bell Park came away with a 4-2 win there. Barwon Heads hosted Geelong Rangers Blue. The Rangers came away from Barwon Heads with a 3-1 win. And uh, North Geelong Warriors Red took on Geelong Soccer Club Yellow. And it was a stalemate there at Alco Park 2-2. Under 12, Joey's boys. Uh, Larry United, 3 Drysdale, 10. So a good win uh, on the road there for Drysdale. And uh, Barwon, 1. Surfside Waves, 4. So uh, two away wins in the under-12 boys, Joey's. So the boys under-13s now. Boys under-13s. Geelong Lions took on Geelong in the all-Geelong intra-club derby. Um, it was the Lions that defeated Geelong 3-1. Barwon Soccer Club uh, played host to the North Geelong Warriors Red. So this is the team that was the under-12 Metros team in, um, in in the Melbourne competition, the North Geelong team from there. And 11-0 um, annihilation there by um, the Warriors. Now, I believe Dominic Posterino, who plays in that team, um, scored four or five goals, if I'm not mistaken. He scored something like 16 goals for the uh, out of the first three rounds. So absolutely dominating there. Uh, then we had a draw between Surfside Waves Lightning and Lara United FC. A very entertaining four-all draw at Shell Road Reserve in Ocean Grove. And then North Geelong Warriors, that's their community team, defeated Golden Plain Soccer Club 4-1 at Alco Park. So a good day at the office for the two North Geelong Warriors teams. Boys under 14, Steve. Uh, Geelong Rangers Blue, nil. Barwon, seven. So good win on the road there for the Grovedale boys. And Lara United, six. Drysdale, nil. So a good home win for Lara. And uh, Bell Park, one. Geelong, nine. So um, a third sort of resounding result in that competition for the boys under 14s. Moving on to the boys under 15s now. Now, Bell Park hosted Carayo in the Northern Suburbs derby. It was Carayo. 
uh, making it three wins from three games. A very, very talented unit they have there at Carayo, four goals to one. Um, a lot of those kids come from um, newly arrived communities, and it is great to see that they are being integrated into the local community, the local society through soccer. Um, I'm led to believe a lot of them are um, Afghani youngsters, and um, some of them are just absolutely electrifying to watch, I'm told. Um, and, um, the, you know, definitely stars of the future. Bar and Blue travel to um, Ocean Grove to take on Surfside Waves. Um, and they won by an identical scoreline, four goals to one. Geelong Rangers Blue played host to Barwon Heads, a 2-1 victory to the Blue team. And the Geelong Rangers White team also played host to Barwon. Um, Barwon uh, White, um, an emphatic 8-0 win there. So a, a great result for the two Rangers um, teams in the under-15 competition. And finally, Breakwater Eagles played host to Drysdale at the White Eagle Club in Breakwater and ran out comfortable. Four two winners in a highly entertaining game there. And last but not least, the boys under-17 competition. Yeah, moving into the older age bracket now for the boys, and it was Barwon Blue nil, Lara United 4. So a good away win there for Lara. Geelong Rangers White 1 over uh, playing Geelong Rangers Blue, who scored 2. So... Uh, in the derby at Myers Reserve there, it was blue over white. And Barwon white against uh, Bell Park blue. It was uh, six goals to two to Barwon white. And Surfside Waves two, Bell Park three was the final result in that one. And thanks to Joe Pino for just confirming there that the uh, Bell Park girls in the under-18s attending Clonard College, that was one of the schools where the students were forced to uh, self-isolate. So that was the reason for that match being course, forfeited. Yep. So hopefully the uh, Bell Park under-18s can get out onto the field and we wish them luck when they do. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it makes, makes perfect sense. Santino Mamoni, who's still celebrating Juventus winning the uh, Scudetto for the uh, eighth time. Uh, in a row, uh, tells us that the halftime score between the Central Coast Mariners and the Western Sydney Wanderers at the moment is nil-nil. So uh, thank you to Santino. Um, now, fantastic. Um, it's been a great show. It really, really has been an, um, a, a, a really entertaining show from, from my end. I hope, Steve, you've enjoyed it as well. But uh, we've certainly done our best to try and really bring um, as much entertainment and history and um, interesting news to tonight's show, and I'm, I'm sure we've done that, our 50th episode, Justice. Um, there on the screen, you can see our other shows. On Thursday, we've got the Football Outwear show with myself and Craig Filer at 7 p.m. Next week on Sunday night, the Football Fan Zone at 7 p.m., and we've got a, a, um, a, a regular Sunday night quiz segment now happening, and um, uh, we've got uh, Michael Ong, who... Uh, who's been the carryover champion now for the last two weeks. And, in fact, it was his young boy, Nathan Ong, that took to the uh, microphone last night, but he was still able to do well. So uh, the uh, uh, the Ong family will be continuing on. Big shout-out to Michael, who is watching this show and um, is, is a regular viewer of both our show and the Football Outwear show. Steve? Let's hope that we can have another week of um, of football, at least the junior football, on and on the various pitches around the region, and um, we'll certainly be all looking looking eagerly each evening to the um, um, the um, COVID stats and hoping that the Geelong region remains steady or, in fact, goes down. And um, let's hope that that is the case and that we can continue having some football in our great region, great greater Geelong region. <laughs> that would be great uh yeah thanks for your show Tonchi, and thanks to everyone who's tuned in at home and there's so many great comments in the comment section i can see the people who are also keen to em embrace the history and um even the recent history there of the the juventus nine scudetto in a row yeah absolutely thank you very much and once again it's been an absolute pleasure and um before we leave, Joe Pino's correcting me. Nine scudettos, not eight. Okay, get that right. Um, is, it, is the plural scudetti? Scudetti. <laughs> yeah, we've got to we've got to brush up on our Italian. On that note, Maybe. Thank, you, thank you very much for being a part of tonight's show. We really, really appreciate it. All the very best, and um, good night for for now until 
next week. Bye. Good night. <laughs>